This is the story of how amazing it turned out to be the internal structure of the atomic nucleus. A story about how an extraordinary adventure is to discover the mysteries of nature. And how this study of the micro world allowed us to understand the life of the stars. So this is what the bottom of a valley of stability looks like. It's not a valley, it's rather a canyon with steep walls. Here, at the very bottom of the canyon, we have stable nuclei, present in nature every day. It's the red ones. On the other hand, the steep walls of the canyon are unstable nuclei. The ones on this side of the valley, they have more neutrons than necessary for their stability. And this, on this side, they don't have enough of them. Does this mean that only stable nuclei exist in nature on a daily basis? And the unstable ones, even if they arise, it's only for a moment, after which they will turn into stable ones? Some unstable nuclei are present in nature around us. After all, Maria Skłodowska-Curie discovered the unstable element radium in the natural uranium blend. Because admittedly, the heaviest elements are always unstable, but they decay slowly, sometimes over billions of years. So, ever since they were created, that is, at least from the beginning of the formation of the Earth, they have not yet completely decayed. Now I understand why radioactive uranium was found even in the Polish Tatra mountains. Okay, you have said a few times that unstable nuclei change into other nuclei. How is this possible? Don't think about unstable atomic nucleus like a nice bunch of protons and neutrons. Really, strange things happen there. An unstable nucleus can change into another one it has decayed in three ways. The first is Fission. Very heavy nuclei, it has nuclei containing many protons and neutrons, they are pretty weakly bound, so they can just spontaneously split into two smaller fragments. So, like a big ripe raspberry, can break a part in our hands into two not necessarily equal parts. Unstable nuclei that fission like this, you can see in our table of nuclei in this remote region at the end. I understand that when such a nucleus breaks up into two smaller parts, these will be the nuclei of the middle part of the valley. The second possible decay mode of unstable nuclei is when the nucleus ejects a group of two protons and two neutrons. We call this the emission of alpha particle, that is a helium-4 nucleus. Why just send a helium-4 nucleus? A group of two protons and two neutrons is very closely bound, much stronger than neighboring nuclides. I showed you how high the binding energy of the helium-4 is. To sum up, both for fission and for alpha particle emission, decay consists in separating some part of a nucleus and getting rid of it by throwing it outside the nucleus. I can imagine that. But there are stranger transformations. For example, in an unstable nucleus that has relatively too many neutrons, a neutron may change its mind and become a proton. How can broth turn into tomato soup? A chicken? Can it turn into broth? Well, it's more likely. You may have heard that neither the proton nor the neutron aren't elementary particles. This means that each of them consists of something. Protons and neutrons are made up of three elementary quarks, specifically the so-called up and down quarks. 
A proton consists of two up quarks and one down quark, while the neutron from one up and two down. Now watch out. There can be such an amazing situation that one of the three consistent quarks will change its type from up to down or Don't vice joke. versa. Don't joke. Seriously, if in a neutron one of its down quark becomes an up quark, that neutron becomes a proton. On its own? A special type of interaction is responsible for such changes, the so-called weak nuclear force. I understand that this is another type of interaction unknown to average people. Before it was the strong force that hold the nucleons together in the nucleus, and now the weak force, which, like a magician, can change protons into neutrons or vice versa. Here is an example. Look at the nuclei on this side of the stability path. They have relatively too many neutrons. Such nuclei may decide to turn some of the neutrons into protons. We call this beta decay. How can you turn your neutron into proton with impunity? It's not completely innocent. With such transformation, other pieces also fly away. An electron is sent out and the so-called electron neutrino. Electron and, what did you say, neutrino? It's such an extremely light elementary particle. We will talk it about it some other time. The electron, as you know, has a negative charge. That is why such a decay of the nucleus is called beta minus decay. All right, this transformation took place, this decay, and from then on, this nucleus is no longer the same. Although the number of a nucleon has not changed, but now it has one less neutron and one more proton. So it became the nucleus of the next element. Look there. If it was a manganese 60, it is due to this beta minus decay, it becomes the iron 60. So the nucleus turned into a nucleus a little closer to the path of stability. Yes, now let's look at the nuclei on the other side of the stability path. These that have relatively few neutrons. They can make a reverse transition. So a nucleus with too few neutrons can decide to turn one of his protons into a neutron, as he has it too few of them. When a proton becomes a neutron, it also emits, by the way, two elementary particles, a positron and the electron neutrino. This decay of the nucleus is called beta plus decay. Plus, because the positron has a positive charge. If one proton in the nucleus changes into neutron, it was through this beta plus decay that it became the nucleus of another element. So, for example, a nickel-55 nucleus became a cobalt-55 nucleus. And with this transformation, as if a piece rolled down closer to us, closer to the middle of the path of the stability. Extraordinary place. Yes, we nuclear physicists conduct research on the slopes of this extraordinary valley. I mean, what exactly you are researching? We study how atomic nuclei are built. And this is not known? I thought it was a bunch of protons and neutrons. I said before that the nucleus, in a sense, is like a drop of liquid. If we take a closer look, this turns out to be even more unusual object. Take a look at how can you see the nucleus? Can it be seen under a microscope? No, no. Under the microscope you can only see something which is about one millionth of a meter. Meanwhile, the atomic nucleus is still ten million times smaller. If you can't see it, how can you study it? To explore, you don't necessarily have to see. During your visit to the doctor, the doctor will sometimes tap your chest. By listening the sound that comes out from the lungs, 
he can infer their condition. Similar in our research, we excite silent atomic nuclei to send us some signal. Will the nucleus send us a signal? Yeah. A stimulated nucleus respond by sending us a burst of electromagnetic radiation. It is a photon. Since it is a photon, we can see it. No, not all photons can be seen. Our eye can only see a narrow range of photons. For example, photons with the energies as low as radio waves cannot be seen. Right. You can't see very high energies either. The eye cannot see X-rays. And these photons emitted from nucleus, they have even higher energies. We call them gamma radiation. Well, you can't see it with a naked eye. Although, the body temperature is also not visible with the eyes, but it can be measured. For this, we have a measuring device called a thermometer. Likewise, in nuclear physics, we have measuring devices that can detect a photon and measure its energy. We perceive the energy of a photon of visible light as its color. The light has many colors. A rainbow in the sky is formed when raindrops split white sunlight into all its component colors. This result. This rainbow we call the white light spectrum. Spectrum comes from Latin language, hence the name of the research method, spectroscopy. In our case, we study photons emanating from the atomic nucleus. Therefore, this field is called nuclear spectroscopy. What are these studies about? You already know the rule. You have to stimulate the nucleus, hitting it with something and then watching what it sends us. Simply. Well, I can't hit them with the hammer. The hammer is so big, you wouldn't be sure what you actually hit. We do it smarter. We hit it with another nucleus. First, such a projectile nucleus must be accelerated. For this, there are special devices which accelerate. We call them accelerators. One such example is the cyclotron. We direct the projectile leaving the accelerator at the nucleus we want to study. The nucleus is so small that it won't be easy to hit. So we are preparing something like a pellet composed of many nuclei of a selected isotope. Let it be, for example, the thin 112 isotope. We call this pellet a target because the nucleus projectile is supposed to hit in it. Oh, there is a projectile nucleus coming from the cyclotron. We missed. The bullet flew right by. Place your hand like this. Do you feel the touch? Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you feel the atoms of my finger touching the atoms of your hand. It's just the repulsive forces created by my atoms have affected your atoms. You felt the impact, even though my atoms did not collide with yours. Same with our projectile and target. The projectile atom didn't have to hit the target's nucleus, but it transferred energy into it anyway. Did you see? Did you see? Some quanta of radiation flew out. Let's wait for the next projectile. Let's stop the situation now. The nucleus of the projectile approached the target. From the energy imparted by the projectile, our target nucleus passed into an energetic excited state. The glow around the target symbolizes this. The projectile turned, but went on. The nucleus of the target, however, is still in an excited state. Oh, now the nucleus has released some of that energy by sending a photon. It is a quantum of gamma radiation. The photon has flown away, but the nucleus is still excited. Only the glow is a little... weaker now. Now the nucleus has emitted a second photon. It is still in an excited state, so I guess we can expect something else. Oh, the third photon. 
It must be over now because the glow is gone. The nucleus has returned to its original ground state. What observations? The excited nucleus released this excitation energy in stages by sending successive quanta of radiation. They flew in a different direction. I noticed that they had different colors, but they disappeared quickly. You said they could be captured by putting some radiation quanta sensitive sensors in here. Yes, we call these sensors detectors. If we want to register quanta flying in different directions, we should use those detectors to completely surround the reaction site. I understand that the detector detects the gamma quantum and its measured energy turns into electrical impulse. The higher the quantum energy, the higher the pulse height. Then the electronics attached to the detector they convert this impulse into numerical data. I like to think of quantum energy as its color. So the color of a quantum we change into a number. Now that we have a number, we can send it to the computer. And even more precisely, we have three numbers because we have registered three quanta. These three numbers describing this particular reaction of ours, we call an event. In the computer, we will collect this information in a table called a spectrum. As I understand it, it's like a lot of compartments. In each, we will count how many quanta of a given energy, given color, we detected. All right, we are ready. Let's go back to measuring. We will repeat our reaction and recording the results immediately. It was an event where we recorded three photons. Red, yellow, and then purple. Oh, now there was an emission of only two photons, yellow and then purple. And now only one, purple. We are moving on. Events repeat themselves, but as physicists say, we need to get statistics. Yes, I know. The longer the measurement lasts, the lower the chance of measurement errors. This is what our table looks like after many collisions. It is measured by us the excitation spectrum of the thin 112 nucleus. In this spectrum, we see that most often there were events when the gamma quantum was violet, slightly rarer was yellow, and the rarest went red. It looks like sometimes the nucleus is excited to a low energy, sometimes higher, sometimes much higher. I wonder why. There can be many reasons. Note that if a specific nucleus projectile flew a little farther from the target nucleus, its excitation energy was low. So its nucleus only emitted a single gamma quanta. Oh yes, if a nucleus projectile passed very close to the nucleus of a target, this gave it more energy. To get rid of it, the nucleus was able to emit several quanta. After the emission, the nucleus returned to its ground state. Interestingly, these quanta were not sent simultaneously. If there were three, they were always in the same order. It looks as if the excited nucleons gives off energy in stages, in a strictly defined way. You are right. This allows us to build such an excitation scheme for our nucleus. What you vividly called colors are measured by the detectors, the energies of the given radiation quanta. So this diagram tells us that the nucleus of T112 excited to a higher energy to return to the ground state, it is as if to cool down, sends a cascade of such a three specific gamma quanta. Wondering, right? Once again you see that our idea of the atomic nucleus as a polite bunch of protons and neutrons, it's too simple. Imagining it as a drop also doesn't explain the situation. 
Note that we have some energy added to the nucleus here. After a while, the nucleus releases this energy in the form of photon radiation. Doesn't that remind you something about the structure of the atom? Sure. I remember from school that the atom has orbits which contain electrons. When we excite an atom, the electrons jump to the higher orbits. Then, falling back to the lower orbits, they give off this energy. Each jump to a lower orbit is associated with the emission of quantum with characteristic energy. It has a wavelength. The excitation of an atomic nucleus can be understood in a similar way. This representation of the nucleus is called the shell model. It says that the atomic nucleus also has orbits inside it, called orbitals, separate for protons and separate for neutrons. That is, the excitation of the nucleus consists in that some nucleons jump to higher orbitals. When the nucleons return to their original orbitals, the nucleus gives off energy by emitting gamma quanta. The quanta we just observed. Our nuclear excitation scheme had one simple cascade of three gamma quanta. See a more extensive level scheme. It's developed in our laboratory decay scheme of gadolinium-147 isotope. Oh, it really is a, a waterfall. As I can see here, the cascade often runs in multiple ways. Discovery and development of such a scheme for a given nucleus, this takes sometimes years of work. But it brings us closer to knowing how a given atomic nucleus is really built. All right, we saw how to study the nuclei that we have in nature. But on the slopes of our valley of stability, there are many unstable nuclei which are not found in nature every day. How to study such nuclei? We make them ourselves. We are just colliding two stable nuclei, but so that they merge like two drops of liquid. So that the protons and neutrons of the projectile penetrate into the nucleus of the target. As a result, we will create a new nucleus, composed of the sum of all these protons and neutrons. This is this nucleus we want to study? Usually, not yet, because the resulting nucleus is very excited. The energy of the excitation is much greater than the binding energy of nucleons. So the nucleus can even afford to throw out some protons or neutrons, which unfortunately becomes a different nucleus, another nuclide. But we take this into account, and with this emission, we get the nucleus we want to study. It's still excited, but not so excited that it can emit particles. Let's see an example of such reaction. A speeding projectile nucleus is coming from the cyclotron, this nucleus of calcium-48. It collides with a palladium-108 target. Oh, the compound nucleus is forming. The summation shows that it is a dysprosium-156 nucleus. If it wasn't a central collision, then our complex nucleus can obtain energy in the form of a rotational motion. Such a rotation can cause the nucleus to assume a different shape. It's like a shape of a spinning rugby ball. First, the nucleus releases the excitation energy, sequentially emitting particles. In this case, four neutrons. With each such emission, it becomes the nucleus of a different isotope. When the nucleus emitted as many particles as it could energetically afford, from now on it will send out only gamma quanta. The nucleus is still excited, but its type will not change. From this point on, it's a nucleus of dysprosium-152, the one we want to research. From now on, we will record the emitted photons and in this way, we will know its excited states. The deformed nucleus still rotates. 
the emission of each gamma quantum causes the rotation to decrease by the leaps and bounds. Finally, the rotation of the nucleus disappears. The nucleus may still be a little excited, but by emitting further photons, it will eventually go to the ground state. Interestingly, the rotation of the nucleus around its axis will be more than the rotation that the Earth has made since the beginning of its formation. And how do we know that this nucleus rotates? You cannot see them. The rotating and hooping slowing nucleus send us a characteristic cascade of quanta. They form such a regular cycle on the spectrum. It's the red ones. After analyzing the events, such a scheme of excitation of this nucleus is built. Top right, you see this characteristic gamma quanta ladder emitted from a rotating nucleus. So, when we get to the bottom of this cascade, the nucleus is no longer such an elongated rugby ball. From then on, it resembles an ordinary nucleus, albeit a little excited. As I see, nuclear spectroscopy experiments discovered many unusual properties of the nucleus. But there is still a lot we don't know. What we already know is used to build some representation. We call this representation, for example, the droplet model or the shell model. There are also others. Which model is the real one? None or a little of each. Each describes certain phenomena correctly to some extent. None yet describes the whole thing. That means we still don't know enough to build a complete model and learn all the mysteries hidden in the atomic nucleus. But new generations of physicists are working on it. Since Thales said that the world is governed by the laws of nature which can be known, we have entered the era of scientific knowledge of the world. We have learned a lot about the world, and this knowledge for centuries has changed our daily lives. Maybe one of you would like to take up this challenge, to discover the deepest secrets of matter. Immerse yourself in this fascinating world of nature's secrets. In a quote often attributed to the scientist Carl Sagan, he said, Somewhere out there, something incredible is waiting to be known. And it is this sense of communing with mystery that gives us physicists wings.